Uh, hello, guys. Welcome hello. to the Nairobi DevOps uh, event. Today we're gonna be talking about networking. You are all welcome. Uh, Sam, the next slide. Hello. So the quote of the day today is, uh, you're brave than uh, you believe and uh, stronger than you seem and smarter than you think. So whatever you do, just know that one thing is that um, you're braver than what you believe that you're brave at. And uh, you're stronger than Are you speaking, Ian? Yeah. Oh, okay. We couldn't hear you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? So, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you now. Good. Or in a short Now we are good. Okay. So uh, our agenda is uh, first of all we'll have a nice breaker, then we'll talk about the meeting expectations. I'll introduce the community. And then we'll have a Q and A. Then the session will begin. Someone. So there's breaker today for today. Uh, is uh, what's your name and where are you joining us from? And uh, the question is, how quickly do you adjust to new trends, or uh, how curious are you? For those who are in uh, WorldCoin, say hi. Uh, it's a good initiative, by the way. I don't know about it so much, but uh, yeah, just tell us about your experience. Anyone on the chat to tell about uh, the experience with WorldCoin? Yes, Samuel. So I, for me, I've, I've not joined it, but I've uh, I've heard about it. Uh, actually, I saw I saw many people outside QuickMart, so I, I actually thought maybe they have uh, an offer. I didn't know it was Worldcoin until later when I came to see that in the news. So, but uh, I tried to 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 do some research about it. I looked at the website and also to see if there is an official speech about it but uh, i couldn't get anything that was clear about it so i'm not well informed but what i know is that people have been signing up for it and getting some money for registering yeah yeah i, th I think i've seen i think i've seen my friends also getting few thousands on it so um, anyone else You can just introduce your name, uh, say where you are, where you are uh, joining us from, and then how quickly you adjust to new trends. Uh, for example, we are talking about the the world coin that has been trending for the last one week in Kenya. So most of you have heard about it. So you can just tell us about your experience with world coin. Feel free to, to to tell us. Hello guys. Hello. Hello Kevin. Am I audible enough? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm Chirchir Kevin. Uh, I'm joining from Baraton University. Uh, but just to the trends, I've been in the cryptocurrency world for a while, but I don't know how this one <laughs> escaped me. So I also did a quick search about it. Uh, I heard they were giving us, they call it the airdrops to, to add a value or something. Yeah, so just did a quick search and I was in a benefit Swiss in miniature. So I just left. <laughs> yeah. 
competition because it's how much uh, you are 7000 i think it's 7000 or something and you are chana na you nikianza kufuatana na hiyo i won't find it it's okay anyone else with an experience of uh, world coin You can just tell us where you're joining us from um uh, what is your expectations for the for the meeting today and then how do you quickly uh, how do you quickly adjust to new technologies like uh, the world coin and then you can tell us your name also You can just unmute your mic and your mic and then uh talk to us. So quickly we'll move to the agenda of the day. Uh some take us to the next slide. So what is your meeting expectations? So uh there are some ground rules for for the event. First of all, you have to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Uh if you have something to talk about or something to raise a concern about, you can raise your hand. You can also use the chat box to write your comments and questions. We also advocate for being respectful and being uh you can be curious and ask things. be respectful of the other person uh we are an open community with a diverse nature and uh we accept views from every kind of person whether you are coming from uh different perspectives we accept that uh we are also re- re- respectful and uh we should always uh give back the same respect that we give to you so if you have something to to, to talk about just raise your hand some next slide so i'll tell you about the community in a brief in a brief uh our mission is to create a supportive and inclusive community that values uh, diversity and uh, supports learning and growth in every dis- uh, different aspects and our vision is to be a leading uh, devops community in nairobi and non- not only nairobi but uh, beyond uh, the boundaries of nairobi in different parts of uh, africa and kenya especially we also uh, want to drive an innovative and empowering professions to excel in their different careers but mostly in the devops careers and culture so we have a wide team uh we have today some here who is our founder and our director we have mamoon uh our assistant director maslin who is the community outreach we have samson alume who is the programs lead um ian to protich um the treasurer and i'm the assistant community outreach we have uh, alvin dungu who is the project lead emma gachoki who is the events and social media manager we have Lawrence Juma who is the assistant events manager we have Franklin Ord the administrator we have Ivy Jepto the creative manager and we have Daniel Orego the assistant creative manager yes we also have Ivan i think his name is cropped <laughs> oh yeah i can so. <laughs> Ivan. Yeah, so Ivan is our assistant project lead. So if you want to help us uh, grow as a community, 
you are very very much welcomed uh you can help us in different perspective you can help us in running different workshops uh where we talk about different tool topics and tools that we use uh, that you might you be using or you might be using we also talk about connecting us uh, with devops professionals you can help us giving us uh, feedback uh after the event you can give us a feedback about the event also you can share ideas on how we might make the community better you can also sharing our post and post on uh, our social media channels you can repost our post and all that which goes on twitter and on all that linkedin and everywhere and also on your whatsapp and you can also help us in uh, organizing events so feel free to reach out to any of our members i uh, will be happy to have you on board so for uh, our today's uh, topic we're going to be talking about the networking and uh, devops and how they intermingle together so our speaker for today is Maslin Mochoma uh, she'll be taking us through this session uh, i hope it will be a lovely one as those who are coming in welcome welcome once again uh feel free uh if you have something to uh, ask about just use the chat if you have uh, something you can raise also your hand we can hear you and uh let's enjoy this uh event so back to you muslim please take over uh, thank you so much ian and sam uh, some you can stop sharing kindly. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Marceline Mochama, and I would love to take you through this topic today of networking and its relation to DevOps. So about me, as I've said, my name is Masilin Mochama. I am a network engineer at Kenjan and um, practicing DevOps engineer as well. So uh, feel free, just be comfortable. I hope you learn and um, let's get to it. So the overview what is a network as you all know a network is where two or more computers or computing devices are connected together uh, and uh, through communication channels such as cables wi-fi and they share uh, they share some devices some files so what you need to know in this session uh just basically in, uh, introduce and then describe the OSI model, the TCPIP model, IP subnetting, routing, DNS, uh, HTTP slash HTTPS, and some troubleshooting that you need uh, in your journey as a, mm. as a network, you know, uh, as a DevOps engineer, uh, yeah. So introduction, um, so uh, I can say that whether you're thinking of starting out or you're already in the field, it's essential to familiarize with some fundamentals of networking and uh, especially since it's a third step, because uh, of course the roadmap of DevOps has so many steps. So as step three, you actually have to be familiar with some of these protocols and uh, network troubleshooting methods 
So any web-based application will use protocols to transfer and receive information from the user. So it's necessary to understand how they support different requests. And uh, cybersecurity, as you know, it's one of the key growing things that is happening. So it's really an essential skill in whatever role that you'll be playing. Uh, if you've been keeping up with the trends, you know that recently there was a um, small cybersecurity issue with our main service providers, Akima, Safaricom and whatnot. So, you know, just goes to show that it's an actually essential skill. So let's start. So uh, the OSI model, it's the first, it's the first topic that we're going to learn today. Uh, it stands for Open Systems Interconnections, and it's a set of standards that defines how computers communicate over a network. The layers, as you can see, they're like seven layers. They build over each other, and they use data from the previous layers. And this data, they serve a specific purpose in the broader network of communication. So we'll start with the topmost layer, the application layer. This is a human interaction, a human computer interaction layer where the application can access the network devices. This is the layer that's currently you and your computer or you and your phone are connected to. So it's the first layer that the user interacts with. And then there's the presentation layer. No, oh, sorry. It ensures that data is in a usable format and it's where encryption occurs. So next is the session layer which maintains communications and is responsible for controlling ports and sessions. And then there's the transport layer. It transmits data using the transmission protocols like TCP and UTP. Uh, then we go to the network layer, which decides which physical path the data will take. Then the data link layer defines the format, the data on the network, or the format of the data on the network. Mm -hmm. Then we go to the physical layer. It transmits raw bit stream over the, over a physical medium. That's just a brief description of the OSI model that you really need to know. The next is a TCP IP uh, network model, which stands for, which stands for transmission control protocol slash internet protocol. So since the OSI model was the former model, uh, it was like the traditional model, which was the mostly broad-based used model. So uh, it later grew into TCP IP. So if you want, um, the OSI model was good. If you wanted just a understanding yeah, juju, of what the network stack was about, but in practice, it was a bit hard. So now they, when they broke it down to TCP IP, it was a bit easier. So it's a four layer type and it combines the first three, uh, the application presentation and session into one unit, which will be now application. And then the transports and the network will, will be combined as well. And then uh, the data link and physical will also become another layer. Okay. So it will become the network interface layer. The application layer of the TCP IP is one of the most important ones since it's responsible for process-to-process -process communication of an IP network. The transport layer should also be uh, should also be used because it introduces several important networking. Concept. So we'll go into TCP IP, into TCP, UDP, and the IP. And this is the most important bit. In as much as the application layer is important, but knowing the core fundamentals of a transport layer is also important. So the two major protocols that are used in the TCP IP model are TCP and UDP, as you've seen in this previous this previous um, this previous image. So where TCP is usually a connection oriented protocol and UDP, sorry, uh, this is this is wrong. UDP is connectionless. 
So uh, TCP is, it first establishes a link between the source and the destination before it sends the data. Once the connection has been made, then it breaks down the large data sets into small packets and sends them along the connection and ensures data integrity throughout the entire, pro throughout the entire process. For example, when you're using M-Pesa, because it has to establish a connection first and then tell you to input your PIN and then so that it can actually finalize the process. So UDP, uh, uh, UDP is usually connectionless and then it just starts transmitting data immediately. So say you want to start a live stream, you won't need it to send you won't need it to confirm with the destination. It will just start transmitting without any other, sorry about that, without any other uh, connection being established. Most TCP ports use are uh, port 22, which is SSH. It allows for remote access and file transfer. 53, which is DNS, which is usually used in resolving domain into IP names. And then there's port 80, which is, I think, the most common. It's a HTTP uh, that serves the web pages. And then there's a port 443, which is HTTPS, type of that, which serves web pages in a secure manner. And then there's port 33 or 6, which is for MySQL for database connections. So the next topic will be IP, Hello. IP submitted. Marceline, before you continue the next topic, can you please tell us yeah. the full meaning of uh, TCP and the UDP? TCP IP. Yeah, just tell us the, instead of having the abbreviation, just tell us in full. Oh, in full, uh, it's a transmission control protocol, slash internet protocol. It's just a network model. And the UDP? UDP is... Uh, yeah. It's a diagram protocol. Okay, we can continue now. No problem. Hello, hello, Maslin. Can you hear? Can you hear me? I'm uh, Amun. You have something to tell us? No, I just wanted to add it on that. Uh, UDP is user datagram. Uh, user datagram protocol. Okay, cool. Uh, Maslin, can you hear? Can you hear me well? Yes, I can. So your your screen is not cast. You can just cast the screen as you continue. Okay, just a second. And to the chat, is anyone with a question? You can uh, just raise your hand or you can use the chat at the uh, right hand corner there. You can just uh, pop your question, we'll answer to it. Uh, feel free. Okay, we'll move to IP subnetting. So IP addresses are usually a crucial element when you're networking. And this includes like surfing and the surfing and the internet and the servers and everything just requires an IP address. As you know, like the internet is just this big broad network and in order to access the network, you need an IP address. So um, an IP address with a two bit number divided into eight bit sessions called octets can be represented in both binary and decimal formats. And the address comes with a mask that distinguishes that part of the IP uh that distinguishes the network part from the host part so we'll use this example that i've just put here that uh this 192.68.12.20 so the 192.68.12 is the network bit and the 20 is the host bit 
So when you're subnetting, there are two types of addressing. So there's the classful addressing where it's it's divided into three classes, the 8-bit, 16-bit, and 24-bit. Uh, so class 8 has over 16 million uh, network addresses, IP addresses that you can use. It's the biggest class. A class B has uh, 65,535 addresses. It's for medium, medium-ish companies and corporations. And there's the class C, which has only 254 IP addresses. So uh, when you want to actually create a network, you want to keep in mind the size so that you can know if you're using the classless bit and you can know which class you're using if you're using the classless or the class one in this case. So uh, the second bit is the classless addressing. Mm -hmm. So I'll just explain classful addressing in a bit. Uh, classful is usually where you only can put uh, six, in class A, you can put 16 million. Class B, you can put uh, 65,000 plus addresses and then class C only to 54. Say you're in a corporation where you need where you need, uh, where you're more than a thousand people, you'll need class C, class C like five times so that you can create your network. So this is going to just make, make uh, routing a bit hard for the network admins. So uh, that's why people came up with the classless addressing where instead of having to, to use class C like four times in order to get the size of your network, you can actually just break just just a bit, and then you can break the uh, the class a bit, where you can actually have more addresses to your uh, to your subnets. So in this case, uh, when we say a slash thirty two, we just mean that uh, it's two five five two five five two five five two five five, which only has one host in that network. So when you break it to slash 25, it becomes, it can hold 128 addresses, which is class C and then you divide it by two, right? And then there's a slash 24, which has 256, 256 addresses, which is just a, a basically a class C. And then now the breaking of a slash 24 to slash 23 adds more into 512. So it is class C times two, you get the flow, right? I hope that's that's understood because there's a lot that goes into IP addressing. And especially when you're coming up with uh, a network, you really need to understand a lot of the subnetting and how it goes. Does anybody have a question? Uh, there is no question, Muslin. We can uh, we can continue. Okay, we'll move to routing. Uh, routing is how we get just information from one network to another network and securely. You can just think of it as a path, where if you're going to town and if you're going to Westlands, you're going to need different destinations and you'll need different routes. Definitely, those are different de destinations, which is different routes, definitely. So we use routing tables to help us define the routes that we want to take. See, when, when we want to make routing decisions, the more narrow routes will be the ones which should be evaluated first. So if a packet destination is, um, this is just an example that I took 10.21.0.0, which is a slash 16. It will just remain in the local network. It's not a, such a big, it's not a big, uh, a big network. So it will just take the slow, this is the narrowest route that will be evaluated. It's like just driving within your neighborhood. So if the packet destination is 10.0.0.0 and it's a slash eight, it's a more big route. So it will be sent to the transit gateway interface. You can use this example as driving to the highway, like from Thika to Nairobi. And then if a packet destination does not fall into any of these ranges, the widest one, which is like 0 to 0 to 0 slash 0, which is just internet traffic. As we know, internet is like the biggest route ever. So it's the biggest network. So 
to just be taken to redirected to that network. So they'll be redirected to network address translation interface where they will just be uh, nutted and transmitted to the internet. Nothing just translates your address into something readable. So we'll go to DNS. DNS stands for Domain Name System. It's a distributed device, di oh, sorry, it's a distributed service that translates human readable names like www.google.com into an IP address like, like for instance, this one. And then the users, the computers can use to connect to each other. So it's just translate human readable terms for instance, www.google.com into machine readable, in this case, an IP address. So um, the DNS servers, they translate requests for names into IP addresses, controlling which server an end user will reach when they type a domain name into their web browser. These requests are called queries. A domain is a self-contained network on the internet and each company has its own domain. For example, like if Nairobi DevOps in this case we would like to acquire a domain, so it will be like, um, its domain will be uh, nairobidevops.com or something or .co.ke. So DNS records, um, they're like zone files. They can commonly be known as zone files as well. They provide information about that domain the IP addresses and how to handle queries associated with that domain. Records also have like a time to leave setting where they also need to be refreshed from time to time. And they indicate how often a DNS server will refresh it. Let's go to the HTTP protocol. Um, it, this is the foundation of any data exchange on the internet and allows you to interact with web pages, APIs, HTML, uh, HTML pages as well. So this, you will need to interact with it on a, on a daily as a DevOps engineer. Um, and it will, it's just something that you do often, especially for API and HTML pages, where you need to send get requests or post requests or delete requests uh, you're actually, it will be like your norm if you're looking at it like that. So a HTTP request is a request message from a client to a server asking for access to a resource. Most of these requests include like gets, which requests the data of an object. Um, the data entry is returned into a response body. There is one for head which is identical to get, but without a response body, more for information or testing. And then there's a post, which submits a change to an object. If you're a DevOps engineer or an upcoming DevOps engineer, you're most likely interacted with, with the most of these requests. And then there's the post, or with this, sorry, the put, which replaces an object. Patch, which updates an object. Options, which describes the communication options for an object and delete, which deletes an object. So some of the response codes that you're likely to get, these are so many. So the response codes, they indicate whether the request was successful or not. And then there's the, the 200 response codes are usually for successful responses, 300s for redirects, 400s for client errors, and 500s for server errors. Uh, for instance, I think the 401, especially for the unauthorized, and there's a the bad request one for 400, for four, which is when the page is not found, probably a server is down or something, they, the client will receive that. I cannot find this. Yeah. Uh, for 500, the, ins the internal server error, I'm just taking samples for the internal server error where maybe there's uh, an error with one of the external programs or something. There's a 502 for the bad gateway 
it's also a very common one. Um, 200 for it's been successful, that's great. Yeah. So uh, there are also HTTP headers that allow the client to add additional information to a request for various reasons, such as authentication, caching, and specify the type of client device setting the request. Headers are also what used to control traffic and implement features as well as scanner releases, blue-green deployments, and testing. So uh, when, you're, when you're working in DevOps, you're going to need to troubleshoot a bit of things. Say your server is down or you can't reach, you can't reach a particular server that you presumed was up or you need to trace the route or you need to defer, um, find like what's the ping speed or just a lot of things that you need to troubleshoot, especially when, when you're working. So we can start with the easiest tool that is ping. Ping is just to just test the connection and availability of a remote host. You just go to your terminal and you click ping and IP address or ping uh, DNS, like in this, in this case, www.google.com. It will just give you a response. It will tell you if it's up or if it's down or if it's receiving downtime at some point, you know, yeah, so there's the choice route. That's the second troubleshooting tool. This one is used when a network is particularly slow and you want to track the routes of your packets or identify which gateway is causing delays. It can also show you possible routes across an IP network and calculate any transit delays in that route. So, it can also be used as trace at because you find that sometimes when you're typing in in your command prompt, oh, sorry, yeah, CMD or terminal, you, when you type in trace root, it probably won't bring the response. So you have to use trace at. Yeah. So it just gives you, it tells you the time to leave. I'm like, where is it dropping? Where are your packets dropping? What server? And this can also be used to identify what server is down because when you trust, when you're tracing your packet, you'll be like, I need to reach that server, and my server is uh, X IP address. So if you're going to type in trace at that IP address, so uh, it will show you the time that it's taking to reach it, where it's taking longer to reach it, and in that way you'll be able to troubleshoot. I find that it comes in quite handy especially when you're in a big network, yeah. So the, the next one will be Telnet. A server responding to trace root of P does not necessarily mean that it's operational or up. You want to be able to test whether or not the protocol you're using will allow you to establish a network connection. Telnet is a command that can help with this. So in this case, whether you, know, you might find that some service providers or sub cloud providers have decided that they will not be, they, they, they won't allow you to ping to their address. So Telnet is usually uh, good to use with this because you'll just use Telnet and that IP address. And then, of course, the username if they have. And then you can find out if you can actually establish a network connection to that particular to that particular server yeah but it's usually a bit uh, uh, it's an insecure protocol so it's not usually advised especially when you're setting up your network it's usually advised that you use the ssh protocol which you're going to learn later on telnet is just usually a low secure low security protocol yeah the network will be cal it's an open source data transfer tool that supports multiple application layer protocols. It's commonly used for sending HTTP requests, which are requests to access a resource on a server. Uh, this one is, I don't, I, okay, I don't use it much, but it just, it's just for sending HTTP requests and this request can just access a server. 
is the dig also the domain information grouper and it's used for troubleshooting domain name uh, domain name system problems and verifying the dns records it performs dns lookups and then shows you the answers returned from the name servers so the syntax that is usually used is just say dig the domain name in this case which will be www.google.com i'll use that domain name often since it's uh, it's a very common domain name. Then, which will make an NS query. Yeah, just a name query and return a record, which is usually an address record for that given domain name. Uh, it's a great tool because it helps you troubleshoot your name servers, double check records, and trace IP addresses and their domain names, among other things. Yeah. There's NetStat. This shows active TCP connections as well as ports on which the server is listening. It's useful when you need to see which network services are running on a local machine. The syntax is usually NetStat and then say a command. In this case, when you use LP, it just shows only the listening servers. When you use A, it shows all active ports. When you use N, only the numerical AP addresses and ports. When you use F, whenever possible, provides all names of the foreign connections to your server. When you use O, it shows the process ID, and R, it just shows the routing table. So there's Nmap, which is usually a network mapper. So the difference when you're using Nmap and when you're using NetStat is that you have to log on to a server. But Nmap in this case scans all servers in the, net, in the network. For NStat, you have to log into a particular server, then you have to check maybe in this case if you're checking for the active ports or the listening servers, but you have to be in a particular server for you to actually listen. And then Nmap, it just scans all the servers in the network. It sends raw IP packets to determine the host available on a given network, what services are offered by this host, and what operating systems they are running. So some cloud providers don't allow Nmap because, of course, there's black hat hackers who use the information provided to exploit vulnerabilities in the network. If like people want to, if the security team of the one organization wants to know what is happening, uh, maybe like just do a test run, they can actually use Nmap, but it's not usually advisable because of course black hats, hackers can also use it. So the next protocol is SSH, uh, which is Secure Shell Protocol. This is a network protocol that allows you to log into remote machines and execute commands on them. It encrypts all data and allows secure communications via an untrusted network. So if uh, you're seated on your machine and there's a server that you want to log on to, you just use SSH. It, um, but of course, SSH has to be enabled on that particular server. Uh, that happens during configuration and so and such and such, yeah. So this one is the most advised because it actually allows secure communications. Because when you're seated on your network, you can't assume it's trusted. So using SSH will actually just encrypt your data and then allow you to log into that machine. So the syntax is SSH, and then you say username, the username that you're using for that server, and then at hostname, which is usually an IP address in this case, yeah. So after you run the command, then the remote server will ask you to provide a password. And then that's it. You're in. Unless it has various other layers of security, which is probably also another password. So after that, then you're in. So uh, the other one is a secure copy protocol. Um, it's a similar secure way to execute actions between a local and remote host, but instead of connecting to a server and executing commands, it transfers files. 
like um what's what's this example mm. say you want to transfer a file a file from say my computer the one that i'm with right now to a particular server so you'll use the secure copy protocol because you can't use ssh ssh just allows you to access that server but secure copy protocol allow you to transfer files to that server that's the difference so the syntax is uh, scp and then file.txt that's just the name of a file and then you put the username at the host name that that of the of the server that you want to transfer the file to and then this is and then the full colon and then the directory of the place that you're you're transferring the file to yes uh so those are mostly the troubleshooting protocols that are available in the in networking because when you're doing devops it's um the only place that you're going to encounter the network is when you're accessing the internet when you're accessing the servers when you're transferring files and you really need to be um you know a bit uh, careful and also savvy thank you i think that's the end of my presentation uh i i'll take this opportunity to welcome any questions Thank you. Uh, hello, guys. If you have any question, just you can uh, raise up your hand, or you can use the chat box. Uh, there's a run a hand raised from Joseph Tuku. The the floor is yours. Okay. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to inquire. Uh, is there um, between UDP and TCP? Uh, which one is secure or most secure? It's TCP. Uh, uh, do, do you mind uh, elaborating just a bit why? Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello, yes, I can. So TCP is just, it just provides uh, error checking and it ensures that the, perfect, the packets are, are delivered in a correct order. And then UDP, because it's um, it's mostly connection. As it doesn't establish connection fast with the with the end user. You can't you can't track all the data packets. So it's actually possible for someone to insert malicious data. Hello. Uh, there's another okay. question from uh, Chir Chir. Joseph, are you are you are you contented? Yeah, yeah, yes, I am. Thank you. Would you have another question? No, no, no. Okay, let's move to Chir Chir. Uh, hi, Bas Masi. So my question is, uh, we are talking about networking in the aspect of I'm guessing this is probably for physical servers. Is there is there a different way you handle the networking and troubleshooting where you are? You're working with cloud environments and probably generalization. Uh, yes, actually, uh, for cloud environments, you also need access. Most of them, you need to log into them because they probably offer you a, a login, what is it called? A login page or how to access your cloud services. Yes, and I know most troubleshooting protocols that I've covered, they are totally used with the cloud cloud environment. Uh, maybe can you can you go through your like a normal day to day troubleshooting process when you are working with a cloud environment? Like where do you start with? Probably if something is not working, 
like your thought process when you're handling issues with network connectivity? Okay. Uh, when you're handling issues with network connectivity, but on the cloud. Okay, first of all, you have to be able to reach your server on the cloud. Ping uh, the destination server. Find out if it's reachable first. If it's not reachable, then you, what is it called? You try Telnet. Telnet into the server if it's enabled, that is, because some devices don't have Telnet enabled. So you have to Telnet into it. If it's not enabled, then you have to use SSH. Otherwise, um, there's usually this, um, what is it called? A virtual environment, a virtual server that is usually provided that you can access it via the internet. Uh, teacher, are you, are you? Ah, uh, yeah, that's okay. It's okay. Just to add on that, just to add on that, I think there's a difference between uh, when you're talking about cloud and some resources uh, in the cloud. Is when you talk about Kubernetes, there's a difference in in uh, networking. But then, what Maslin has explained is just the basics of uh, what networking all has. It is the fundamentals of everything in terms of networking, even in the cloud perspective. And uh, it is the basics of how you should understand how the cloud network works. Because when you check out the AWS and the GCP and the Azure, these are different uh, cloud providers that may have a different uh, perspective to their networking. Okay. And uh, what we have here is the basic to everything. Anyway. Uh, tell me you have a, uh, your hand is raised. You can uh, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Mas hi, Maslin. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question mainly is on uh, DevOps. Um, have you gotten uh, to work with uh, any automation tools uh, that I hear about, like Ansible? and those uh, playbook uh, configurations. In, in practice, yes. In practice, for, for configuring uh, routers and switches. Actually, no. Uh, Rotich. Uh, yes. Selvin, I didn't get your question really well. Why are you asking if we have been able to use Ansible for configuring routers or? Uh, yes, uh, working with the automation tools, how is your experience working with them? Because normally I just mm -hmm. uh, hear about them and people normally love about love, love them in their own uh, personal computers, things like that. Uh, but I've never had in our side uh, people working with tools like Ansible, the playbooks, and configuring a network. So this question is there to the whole of the community. If anyone has worked with uh, Ansible, configure networks, then just answer Telvin, apart from Maslin. Yes, Tony? Okay. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Loud and clear. Okay. So on this question, to be honest, I don't have much uh, practice with this configuration tools like uh, Terraform, Ansible, just a bit. But on that question, there's a book I'm reading on um, infrastructure as code, and the author comes from like a, you know networking background and they um as they were learning and learning infrastructure as code i think the author was using started using um these tools i think it was terraform she said and even others she recommends others but you know these tools are normally used by devops uh guys probably but um as she like in the book she was talking 
talking through how she was also using them to automate network infrastructure, so routers and stuff like that. Yeah, so in that case, I think some of them um, do use um, do use these tools even just for the network inside. Uh, yes, Samuel. Thank you, Ian, and Tony as well, and Marceline. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, at, uh, what I understand, how networks maybe are used, uh, maybe in the, in the terms of DevOps, is uh, in DevOps, you're working with distributed systems. So you have, for example, several servers, and one of the tools, as somebody asked here, is a tool like Ansible that can enable you to automatically manage several servers uh, without having to log in into each server physically or manually, having someone doing that on each server. So uh, this is like a bot that will be able to, because it uses SSH, Ansible uses SSH to log into the servers. So you can be able, so long as you've uh, set up your keys, uh, you've given Ansible permission to access your servers. It can access all servers and any network configuration that you'd like to do on your servers, you write that in a, you can write that in a playbook. And then in that one, in uh, that one playbook, you can be able to effect the configurations that you desire to have on your servers by maybe running one command and that is going to be applied on all the servers that you have. Does that answer your question? The person who asked. Uh, yes, it answers a bit. I just wanted to inquire if anybody has worked uh, with any of those tools before in an organization. So before before Brian uh, Endeavor uh, speaks on this, I have something to add on uh, in infrastructure's code. There's a tool called uh, Crossplane, and I think uh, it's one of the most tools that I think uh, we should be using in infrastructure's code. Someone has talked about uh, the Ansible, Ansible playbook, but when you come to Crossplane, instead of writing the playbook, uh, cross planes takes another different approach whereby you just write a YAML file describing how your infrastructure will want to be. Let's say you have a bucket, you want to have a bucket from uh, AWS and you have uh, and something else from AWS. You just describe it in a YAML file and then you push it to a Git repository. Then Ansible will automatically uh, provision the infrastructure for you and give you the end use of it so uh that is a good thing and then also before we move to brian tony uh we have been asked that uh you should uh, tell us the book that uh what is the book that you have been using so that uh, someone is asking in the chats and then uh brian you can continue with the question oh um okay so the name of the book i've put it in the chat but it's called Patterns and Practices for Infrastructure's Code. Uh, the author is called Rosemary Wang. So I can send it again if someone didn't see it. Okay, uh, sure, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. So to answer Tevin's question, uh, I previously was a network engineer who transitioned to DevOps. So Ansible can be used to configure, yeah, uh, be it switches, be it routers. And though I personally haven't configured it uh, on, on a live environment, I've loved it, uh, but I've used also Python to configure uh, live switches and routers. So Ansible is mostly used, yeah, it's, it's, it's used in, uh, in live environments to configure. But I bet uh, many companies in Kenya won't use it. Maybe maybe the the likes of Safaricom who have large infrastructure uh, and can't allow you to configure uh, one by one physically. So I'll say, yeah, it's used. 
Ja. Uh, Tevin, are you uh, contented with the question? Uh, yes, I'm contented. Thank you for the response. So the slides of the talk will be shared also after the meeting. Also, the video recording of this uh, session will also be shared in our YouTube channel. You can also check it, check on it after the recordings. Uh, anyone with a question, to it's, it's the time for questions. Feel free to raise your questions. One of uh, Maslin, a question to you. The key the key considerations when setting up uh, networks for DevOps, especially the security side. Marceline, if you can Hello, hear me. yes. Yes, I have. I, I can hear you. Let me repeat the it, question. It will be. Mm -hmm. what, what are the key considerations when uh, setting up networks for DevOps, especially the security side? I, I would like to just post this message. I'm sorry, this question for the whole community for anyone who has an answer. Because from my perspective, I would think um, maybe make sure that your network devices have SSH configured. And um, that's, just, that's just it. But others are free to answer. Uh, anyone with uh, something else to add on that, of, uh, what, what Maslin has talked about, uh, feel free. Uh, Brian, just uh, the stage is open. Sure, to add on that, uh, on security, uh, in the DevOps side, it's mainly about access, access to servers, or where applications are hosted. So first you should block, it, uh, the first rule is to block all ports and allow, you can only allow maybe HTTPS and HTTP and also SSH you allow from specific IP addresses. You can't allow, so you block all and then start allowing from specific IP addresses. So I think that's a, a starting point. So the network should be, shouldn't be open to all. Yeah, so you'll find via, let's say if you are cloud networks like AWS, security groups are a, are a starting point. So security groups uh, will even be recommended to block all all, all networks, that's 0.0.0.0 zero, zero dot zero dot zero dot zero slash zero, then open now for specific IP addresses. Now, if it's, if it's example is my IP address want to access a server, I'll open only for my IP address only for your colleagues or your office IP, and so on and so forth. Okay, cool. Uh, I have a question that I'm going to ask the whole of the community. Uh, when you're talking about networking in terms of DevOps, uh, and uh, as you know that uh, Kubernetes is the best infrastructure of the cloud or the best OS of running the cloud, applic applications in the cloud, and uh, one thing we know is that uh, Kubernetes abstracts networking uh, from, our, from our site. So uh, what are your basic use between uh, Linkard, which is a service mesh tool, and uh, Istio? Anyone in the community to talk about, just share some light about the differences between the two. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Um, a difference between ISTO and what? The difference between Istio, yeah. Istio and Linkard, which is a, a service mesh tool. We just talking about mm -hmm. Linkard, the, the graduated one from, uh, you know it? I have heard of the, both of them, but I really haven't used service mesh 
uh, as a resource when um, working or um, using Kubernetes. So yeah, maybe someone else would um, have an answer for that. Anyone else? And then uh, please, if you have a question, feel free to pop up your question. So I'll share my experience when working with networking in DevOps. Uh, when you're using different these different tools in uh, service mesh tools, we it's a networking concept that we we used in um, uh, DevOps engineering roles. They both have uh, the same capabilities, but the difference is just one. One it more one is more lightweight than the other. So Linkerd is more lightweight than Istio. So, uh, anyone with a, a, a question in uh, anything else before we close up the session for today? Uh, it's, the floor is open. Uh, Tevin, please. Uh, mine is a different question. Um, uh, do you have a, a site on social media where uh, you meet? Or oh, this is the first forum for networking and DevOps? So for those who have joined us today for the first time, uh, we are the Nairobi DevOps community. We are a wide community. Uh, Tevin, just put your mic off. So we are a wide community whereby we have meetings every Sunday, uh, this time of the, of the day. We have uh, also we have physical meetings at different places. For example, we're gonna be having a physical meeting at uh, Moringa in the next few months, few weeks in August and in September. You can uh, reach to us through our social media. Uh, we'll share the link to our WhatsApp group. So we'll also share the link to our Twitter. You can search for us at Twitter, at Nairobi DevOps uh, community, also at LinkedIn. You can just search for us. Feel free to reach to any of our members here, from Maslin to uh, Samuel to uh, the other members that I share their names on the when the meeting was starting. Uh, feel free if you want to be part of this uh, community. If you want to talk about a certain thing in uh, DevOps, feel free to reach out. We have a uh, uh, we have a form going out uh, going out that you just need to apply to become a, a, to have a session like this. So uh, feel free to uh, talk to us, feel free to come and uh, join the backend team and help us achieve uh, more greatness and spreading the world of DevOps in Kenya and uh, Africa in general. So as uh, we are going to close the meeting for today, anyone with a question before we close up? Uh, it's the last chance we have uh, these questions, please uh, feel free to raise them. You can write through the chat or you can just raise your hand and uh, we'll give you the space to talk. As we are waiting for the last question, uh, Maslin, uh, can you give us the closing remarks? Uh, yes, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, for listening through. Also like uh, if you have any contributions, you can follow us on the Nairobi DevOps community on LinkedIn on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Discord, and will be available. We look forward to more sessions with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maslin, for the for the talk today. 
uh, as you're closing, I'll just like to invite Samuel to close the session. Is our is our chairman who uh, is responsible for running the community. He's also a good man from uh, Oringa, where he teaches DevOps. He will uh, just shed the light on what he does and then close the session for today. So uh, thank you guys for coming. So back to you, Samuel. Okay, thank you so much, Ian, for leading the session. And thank you, everyone, for patiently uh, waiting and listening. Uh, we believe that you've learned something. So maybe uh, if I could just say one last thing is, uh, in case you are new to DevOps and you're wondering, or you are, you've just learned DevOps, and uh, maybe you do not understand networking, and you are seeing that there are many things to learn, uh, I would encourage you to uh, not worry, because uh, it's just one step at a time. You learn one thing. You learn a little bit about networking. As, as you go on, you continue strengthening the muscle. Uh, but know that it's just a step-by-step -step thing. You start somewhere, and then you get, uh, you'll be able to get to your destination. So if uh, you see maybe the terms, the networking terms seem to be hard, or something of the sort, uh, you'll just be able to get there with time. So uh, for DevOps, it's just uh, you work with a lot of uh, tools that are, in, that are distributed. Like, for example, you have one computer here, you have another computer elsewhere, and maybe that one computer has your database, another, or it, or it has part of your database, another one has another one or your application is running in different locations. So you have to have a network that does ensures that happens. So you can be able to communicate to those uh, servers. So um, that is all I can say. And uh, thank you guys for joining. I'll share this video on YouTube. It, I'll upload it to, to YouTube, and then I will uh, share the link in our sub channel. So maybe Marceline, you can scroll to the slide where we have the QR code for our WhatsApp groups or, and LinkedIn so that they can join and Twitter. So you can just scan the QR code, but I think there is a better one at the bottom. You can scroll to the bottom. Ian, it's Ian actually. So Ian can scroll to the bottom. There is uh, one with the bigger QR codes. One slide. Just uh, press the, yeah. Oh, was it removed? I think uh, it should have been there, but you can scroll up. We can just use the one that is available. Yeah, so uh, these QR codes that you can see here, you can be able to scan them and you can be able to join our community. So from our community, you'll get to interact uh, with more people, especially the WhatsApp. I think it's a little bit active, uh, but we're hoping it's going to be more active. So there you can be able to get uh, what people are sharing and you can also be able to have access to the links that we share there for our videos and our events. So... You can join our LinkedIn, join our Twitter, and uh, WhatsApp. Those are the most active ones. And also follow us on YouTube and subscribe so that when you upload a video, you can be able to watch it. Like for this session, you can, in case there was something you didn't understand, you can go back to that video and understand. So I think that is it, guys. Uh, we are planning, uh, uh, maybe an announcement. We are planning an Nairobi DevOps Summit where we intend to bring over two, more than 200 DevOps engineers together uh, in September. And uh, we are hoping that you guys uh, will be able to see you there. And uh, it's going to be a full day event. So where we are going to learn from uh, DevOps engineers and also from companies maybe that are showcasing new tools. So that is what uh, we are hoping for. And uh, we believe it's going to be a very good uh, session for the Nairobi community and also for Kenya. So uh, thank you for joining and I wish you guys a good night and a good week ahead.
So, uh, you guys, you can uh, feel free to leave at your own uh, reel. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's meet on next Sunday. We'll also have the same event on different topics.